Okay, I hope everyone's charged their mugs or glasses or, or whatever with refreshments and had a bit of a break. Um, I'd like to welcome Matt Gantley as well from UCAS, the CEO. And um, uh, Paul has had to drop off. Um, so welcome, Matt. So let's go to some audience Q&A. Welcome. It's lovely to see you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Matt. Let's go to some of the audience questions that we had um, while people were presenting their, their position and their organization. What do panelists think are the biggest opportunities and challenges for transatlantic cooperation on these issues beyond a webinar like this? What are the opportunities and challenges that, that you see from your perspective? Um, I'll start with you, Farinaz. So um, I actually want to flip it. I think we've had tremendous opportunity, especially with our UK colleagues, um, our colleagues at the OECD. Uh, GAO is a member of the International Supreme Audit Institution. And through that global uh, collaboration we have with over 140 partner countries, uh, we have a unique opportunity to kind of talk across these emerging technologies, issues of big data, issues of science and technology, AI. We have working groups where we, you know, we, we're planning to share our framework and also learning from our colleagues in India, uh, in the Netherlands, in Germany. And so because of that InterSight platform, which is the Supreme Audit Institution space, uh, GAO actually is, has actually benefited a lot from broader global collaboration and we've been able to share learnings and best practices. So, uh, you know, we obviously look forward to to other platforms as well, where we can learn uh, and, and continue to move forward with uh, with a version 2.0 of the framework if that's needed. Uh, so uh, I think there is a lot of strong global discussions currently happening mm -hmm. when uh, uh, on the issue of AI. Great. Does, does anyone else have any thoughts on opportunities and challenges for cooperation? I think in, in my space, in the labor and employment space, it's critical because the technology that HR vendors that are creating this AI is going to be is being used, not just here in the United States, but around the world. So I think it's very critical that we continue to have these discussions and that because we're all at the forefront of either AI laws or, or regulations, um, when it comes to labor and employment, uh, you know, those discussions and I've have been having many discussions with uh, you know, academic scholars and officials from around, around the world of how do we um, ac actually do this right uh, on the outset because like I said this technology is out there it's being used here in the, the same technology is being used in the United States and that's being used uh, for large companies globally so how do we get those best practices out there for the developers when they're designing this to be mindful uh, of not just our laws but all the uh, regulations relating to the uh, ethical use of uh, AI in employment Great. And, and there's, there's uh, several questions actually about the difference between developers of products and users. So an employer in your case, Keith. Um, and how are we going to separate out those responsibilities of product developers being responsible and accountable for developing a system that is, for example, free from bias and those of the end user in configuring, monitoring, and, under, and taking accountability for understanding how they're using that system in order to prevent issues like bias. How are you thinking about subdividing these responsibilities? Um, Keith, do you want to go first? Yeah, and, and this is a very uh, uh, interesting question and one I get all the time. And I believe that, especially with the, uh, the people involved in this industry from the engineering part of the AI, that if the EEOC says something regarding the proper use of AI, um, related to the laws we administer and enforce that uh, the majority of these vendors, the ones at least in good faith that truly um, are, are trying to create ethical AI are going to listen. So not going down the, the path of the legal analysis of jurisdiction over vendors for enforcement actions, but I look at everything we do here at the EEOC is twofold. One, we're, as I said in my intro, we're a civil law enforcement agency, and we have to enforce these laws. So if there is discrimination being used, uh, occurring by algorithms, then we're going to enforce it uh, against those who are using it. But on the educational side, you know, it is our mission to prevent this, any discrimination, and we do that through, through guidance and educational outreach. So to me, they go hand in hand because of our limited resources. So I, I truly believe that 
giving that that guidance and saying, okay, here's you know when you're designing these AI, here's here's the laws that you need to take into account. Um, I believe that that will reach vendors, that will reach the people who are not necessarily um, questionably subject to our, our jurisdiction. Uh, I do believe in good faith that they are going to comply with that because the people who are buying the software and the employers using it are going to demand that um, um, before they actually purchase it. So I, I think we can have a very large impact on, uh, on everyone involved in uh, being subject to this technology from the employees to the employers buying it to the vendors creating it through guidance and outreach. Okay, and, and Hugh and, and Matt, maybe you've got some thoughts about other areas of certification where both the end user of the product and the product itself are required to be certified in some way. Does that exist in any other industries or contexts? We're both thinking. <laughs> I suppose uh, good, can... good question. I'm not too sure that there's many examples. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to the question before, actually. Uh, I, I'd, I'd have to ponder on that that point further. But let me, let me re maybe turn the question around into uh, where there is more example of this. And maybe it's linked back to your, your, your earlier question is um, accredited conformity assessment or accredited certification lends a huge amount of value to, to this uh, arena um, in a number of different ways. Firstly, because it, it's about consensus-based standards. Standards that are developed based upon requirements from regulators, from industry, from um, users of the, those products or services where the community comes together to create a consensus on what the appropriate requirements are that could be bias within artificial intelligence, it could be food safety, food safety standards. The opportunity for, for um, consensus-based standards is, 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 is huge and it lends itself uh, especially well to governance standards for um, artificial intelligence. Another major aspect of, of uh, accredited certification is the development of, of certification bodies and they are of course by their very nature um, connected to the bodies of which they're uh, assessing the the, uh, the product or the service and so the accreditation body which evaluates this certification body makes sure that they're doing that competently impartially and consistently and those uh, both accreditation and conformity assessment are part of an international consensus-based framework of governance, ensuring that the whole process works together and, and, and holds together, making sure that those uh, consensus-based standards are implemented properly and there's a governance framework in place. And there is a management system standard on AI systems, which I, from memory, I can't remember if it applies to users as well as, uh, sorry, in development. I'm not, can't, from memory, I can't remember if it applies to users or just developers, I think it's both. So maybe we could see something where users of AI are being accredited against the management system, certified against the management system standard, and developers are being certified against specific technical standards such as on, on bias. It will be interesting. Okay, um, question on innovation. Yeah, uh, yeah on I think in, in the way that we interpret it, uh, yeah, I think there is. I, I was just thinking a little further on this user and uh, developer piece. So. Um, the, the development of ISO 42000, which is the, the new management system standard that's really just kicked off in terms of the application of, of artificial intelligence. Um, I, I think that within its scope of coverage for the certification, it does cover both the, the, the development of that AI and then its ultimate use. So yeah, the, the, there is application for that. Right. Sorry, no, I just wanted to add in, you know, one of the points that our expert panel members uh, noted was this notion of an appeals process, right? That from the user perspective, uh, you need some documentation. One, you need a process for the user to be able to appeal based on their experience of the of the system. 
And then you need documentation and then correction or mitigation strategies. Uh, and that's something that the, the panel of experts that we convened thought was very, very important. And the way we capture it in the AI accountability framework is a practice around external stakeholder outreach and the user community is key in that in that outreach and ensuring that if there are any issues that are raised um, throughout the implementation, the deployment of the system itself, that those are captured, uh, corrected, and mitigated. Got it. Okay, thank you. So moving on to innovation. Um, so Keith gave some examples at the start of how AI can actually help remove cognitive bias um, in employers or people selecting candidates. And that's an example of how AI can be used innovatively and for good. But it is um, it is more complex than that. And there is still other types of bias that, that could be introduced. I mean, for example, you can never remove all of the bias. You always want to be biased towards people with PhDs when you're hiring for professors at a university. Um, but you know, you can't do much about the number of people with PhDs from different backgrounds that already exist within the available community. So the societal bias issues. There's also complex technical uh, bias issues that are hard to detect. So for instance, in the UK, we had an issue with the application form to join a university, the national uh, UCAS uh, application form, where natural language, not in terms of features, not in terms of specific data items, but just the style of writing of people from certain ethnic backgrounds was triggering their application to university to be more likely to go into the fraud pile. Um, I don't know why people fraudulently apply for universities, I'm not sure, but apparently they do, and apparently there is a fraud detection algorithm. And nobody's really got to the bottom of that and understood that. Similarly, there's lots of complex areas in computer vision where we don't actually have the tools and techniques outside of you know, uh, R&D at a university to necessarily remove all the different types of bias. So we know that there's things we can't do. We know that we can't get it perfect. And we know that we want to support innovation. And we want to support things like startups. So I'd be really interested in people's thoughts around how we manage the impact on innovation and SMEs um, as you know, there are various initiatives around um, regulating AI starting to appear. It's a shame we haven't got Paul for this bit as well. So anybody got any thoughts on this topic? In the in the, uh, in the HR technology space, you know, they've been asking for regulation or guidance for a long time, and it, as I said in my speech about in my intro about some of the benefits of uh, AI in, in my space about removing that uh, unconscious bias or the direct bias. Um, I, I think that the more we can do here to give that uh, guidance on how it applies to our existing laws, that's gonna spur more innovation. And, and the more we can help the developers create this, being mindful of these complex federal anti-discrimination laws that we have in the United States, I think that will give them the certainty that they can create and develop new pro products to truly help eliminate um, bias and discrimination from the workplace. So from my perspective in my space, and I, and I know I'm, I'm narrow here, but I, I think that the more the EEOC can do here to help, um, again, those three groups, the employees who are being subject to this technology, the employers who are using it and the vendors creating it, it's gonna spur new developments, new products that ultimately will help achieve our goals. And if I could jump in here, yeah, I mean, the notion of just continuous monitoring, right? That has to be our mitigation strategy. It's not, it's not when, it's not if bias, it's when bias. Uh, this notion of unconscious bias can enter into the system at any point, just like in any non-AI space it occurs. Uh, I think in the AI space, we just have to assume that it will occur uh, consciously or unconsciously. So the continuous monitoring loop and being able to catch and have mitigation strategies, um, either you know stopping the model or the solution itself or the system itself, or noting that, okay, there was some inherent introduction of bias somewhere in the decision rule that we need to check on. Um, but I think the if statement uh, really needs to move to, to the when statement. And if I had my managing director on, he would say this is not unique to AI. People are biased. And we try to mitigate and manage that, especially in, in the government mm -hmm. space, routinely through our DNI efforts. And so to assume that these computers, through the data that we've ingested, which is incomplete often, has inherent bias, the use of proxy variables that sometimes are not appropriate, um, the mitigation you know, strategies for data management may not be appropriate. It, it's just, it's inevitable. So continuous monitoring really has to be our mitigation strategy. 
and I probably want to, to hew and Matt, that continuous monitoring market surveillance, I mean, that's a part, an existing part of certification within the UK, isn't it? Well, it, it is up to, up to a point, but it, I think traditionally, you know, and in fact, you know, Karen has said something similar, you know, we tend to have a, an annual audit. Uh, one of our non-executive directors is... Uh, yes, across many different areas of... Yeah, I was going to say one of our non-executive directors is a guy called Professor Michael Manelli, who's a very interesting American, uh, although he's now based in London and he is, is very involved in, in, in fintech. But, you know, he often makes the point to us, you know, why do we do things on an annual cycle? You know, we don't worship the planets anymore. This is not the Stone Age. You know, what's so special about every 12 months? And I think with... Yeah, you know, with the development of AI uh, and the use of data, you know, we can go to continuous monitoring in a lot of areas. Uh, and, you know, we're not looking at a, a snapshot in time. We're looking at things averaged over, you know, rolling periods of 12 months or 24 months or since the beginning of, of the measurement. So it, it produces a, a different approach to things, which as long as we set it up right, will give you would think better results. Thank you. Okay, let's go to another question from the audience. Um, do the panelists have any strong opinions on the use of um, certain technologies? I mean, I think uh, Paul outlined some kind of red lines, social monitoring, for instance. Um, in particular, facial analysis, emotional analysis um, are very very contentious ai techniques um do you have any views on these techniques and whether they should be outright banned well at least from again from the labor and employment space for technologies that have been developed to um, monitor facial affects or analysis during the actual interview process i know the state of illinois has has moved forward and discussed some of that so you're seeing a patchwork of local laws addressing that and in some cases outright banning it so but from the eeoc's perspective whether or not facial uh, affects or the way your, your voice tone is during an interview or the words you say, whether or not that is gonna determine whether you're the best employee or you're not a good employee or you're applicable for the job or not is a little bit beyond our purview. But what is directly in our jurisdiction is whether that technology uh, has a disproportionate impact on certain uh, genders, race, national origin, or more importantly, people with disability. So somebody who has an accent the, the, the speech recognition program may not be able to recognize them opposed to somebody who speaks in you know uh, in perfect uh, English or so for some of these uh, facial recognition technologies if somebody um, you know has a disability and, and doesn't know where to look or they have they can't move their face are they going to be given a lower score based on somebody who doesn't have that disability which directly impacts the laws we administer and enforce here at the EEOC. So there's significant um, problems with those technologies when it comes to certain, um, uh, even uh, genders or people of national origin. I know there's some, uh, the MIT Gender Shades Project did a study on this facial recognition technology. And for white men, it, it was able to pick up 99% of, of white men, but for, um, uh, uh, for females uh, of darker skinned females, it was much lower, something like 65 to 75 percent. So, you know, that inherently, if you can't, if the computer can't even recognize you um, just based on, you know, the color of your skin, that's a tremendous issue for the for the EEOC, then moving forward to what it's actually analyzed. And so there's a, there's a lot of issues from the anti-discrimination law that um, related to either national origin, gender, or more importantly, um, or equally importantly, excuse me, is uh, uh, disability discrimination. So a lot, a lot of issues for the EEOC on that. Thank you. Farinaz, any thoughts? Yes. Um, so, you know, no comments around banning any specific tech uh, in particular, but the notion of facial, fa facial recognition and federal use, federal implementation of facial, uh, facial recognition software. GAO just released a report two weeks back 
on, on some challenges associated, and I think the commissioner laid them out very well, and it really has to do with the training and the testing of the data, right? The model itself uh, and, and, and the type of information, how the model learns uh, when it comes to women versus men, light skin versus dark skin, um, uh, that's really important, uh, in, in especially in, in government applications. Uh, but I don't think that we would ever say that there is any um, AI solution or tech that that um, is a yay or a nay. I think we leave that up to federal agencies to determine. But there are a lot of shiny, you know, shiny tools out there. There are a lot of ga gadgets out there. But I think what the framework is asking federal implementers to think about is, well, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? And what is the clear goal and objective of using this technology versus traditional methods? You know, what, what is new here? What, what is the traditional methodology or the traditional technology not helping you achieve that you want to use, you want to move to an AI solution? So that's that's really the approach that we would expect uh, federal implementers to take. That makes sense. I think I think computer vision in itself is a really interesting area when it comes to accuracy and, and bias. Um, because first of all, there's there's no proxy variable. You can't hide how you look for computer vision, right? Your your skin color is going to be there. Whether you're wearing makeup is going to be a factor, and that's a cultural factor as well. Uh, whether you're a man or a woman, etc., and so many other factors as well. You know, there are problems with like disability. Uh, yeah, like disability. People sat down in a wheelchair. They aren't recognized necessarily as people or as obstacles to a, a self-driving car. And one of the problems that we have in trying to evaluate things like that is that well, skin tone is one thing. You can you can kind of tell skin tone from an image programmatically, but finding all the different possible street scenes that could happen and, and things like that um, is really hard. And building up that test data set to even evaluate for some of these problems is really hard. And when I talk to computer vision companies who are doing things like street scene analysis or um, facial recognition, what they're finding is whereas they used to have, you know, in traditional software environments, a support team full of people who could turn servers on and off and solve customer tickets, they now have their most expensive data scientists sat monitoring on a continuous basis their production systems, coupled with um, um, other people in the ecosystem, maybe crowdsourced workers, even people in refugee camps who are labeling data to provide the ground truth that then allows the data scientists to evaluate the accuracy. So these are hugely complicated problems. And it's, it's one thing to solve it with tabular data or loan data or financial services data. Some of these areas are, are really complicated. I don't know if, Baron, as you, you dug into any of these complexities in your GAO report uh, around areas where this is less studied. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe, uh, and I just posted our facial recognition, um, uh, re federal implementation of federal recognition software in the, in the chat box. I think one key area that we had, which we really flag in the framework, is the use of diversity really in the in the designer data scientist community, the labor, the labelers, the uh, you know those that are actually uh, you know looking at uh, the characteristics um, and, and proxy variables need to be a diverse group of stakeholders. For instance, in our panel itself, our panel was 60% female and 40% with some minority ethnic origin. You need those types of stakeholders at the early design phase because you're just not going to catch some of these issues, uh, especially in some of these softwares. You really, it's not a function of being trained in DNI. It's a function of having that experience. For instance, something as small as we had a designer note that, well, we, we had a data set, we didn't want to identify any racial characteristics. So we used a proxy variable, we used zip codes. Now, understanding that zip codes inherently also have some demographic, right? Um, uh, socioeconomic uh, elements attached that you need some contextual domain expertise uh, in variable selection uh, that is just not from a method perspective. And so we raised the point, uh, and I think our facial recognition software um, report also knows, is the notion of diverse um, recruitment and workforce skill sets uh, at the, from the designer community, the developer community, and then as well as policy experts. Uh, Adam, I don't know if I clearly address the question no. you were raising. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great point. I think um, one of the questions we have actually is quite relevant to this, which is about organizations and their culture, including their, their diversity of those organizations. By diversity, I'm I'm referring to a multitude of different things, whether it's domain experience, perspectives. Um, 
how do you ensure uh, slash audit slash certify that an organization has appropriate diversity of thought and diversity of experience to be able to do that kind of, of work? That's really hard, isn't it? Does anybody have any answers for that? REI framework definitely poses a series of questions, maybe not answers, but as auditors, we need to be asking, you know, who was involved in the designer phase? What, 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 what was their background? How aware were they on these issues uh, of, of, you know, of diversity, desperate impacts, ethics? So there are a series of questions and from a training perspective, you know, uh, be it private sector or government, what type of training uh, is actually provided uh, to the developers and designer community and how are you ensuring this throughout the AI lifecycle? Because even at the deployment stage, stage, the operational environment can also introduce a lot of these biases. So it's not just during model development, but it's in the operational space as well. So uh, there are a series of questions and that's why the framework provides that, you know, what the question is. Uh, for the uh, third party assessor and the auditor to kind of get to this point. So what's your next steps with the GAO framework, for analysis? It sounds like a lot of work has gone into it. How are you going to ensure its adoption across the, the target? Yeah, well, I mean, just by my my being here uh, is one way we're getting the word out uh, that this framework is is out there. And, and, and for us, the work has just begun. Um, like I mentioned in my comments, the framework's very broad and at the aggregate level, it's not use case specific. I think in our next phase, what we're looking for is feedback and more of a case study approach. For instance, you know, Department of Transportation's application of autonomous vehicles, how would this framework be applied in that scenario or the criminal justice if it's adjudication? or in the HR department, you know, um, how, how is that process working? So I think we are looking for a, uh, we're already thinking about our 2.0 uh, version, which is going to be very use case specific, but we want feedback. I think we definitely want to put this framework to use, but we want our federal implementers, practitioners, the evaluations community to give us feedback, you know, in terms of is this practice, is it appropriate? Uh, is the question correct? Is the audit procedure providing enough in, in terms of scope and methodology? And so that feedback is really critical to us. And I, 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 I open this to this audience here as well as, as you review the framework and you come across something that you think that we did not address or fully address, and that there's an opportunity for us to do that in our future work, uh, please, uh, we, we look forward to that feedback. Currently, we do have ongoing audits. Uh, in AI, in, in, in the US government, uh, within GAO. And so we're looking to applying our framework currently to our ongoing work and having some lessons learned uh, as we think about next steps. Great, okay. So just to move on a little bit to the ecosystem. Um, so I was going to say regulatory ecosystem, but I'm not going to say regulatory, I'm just going to say ecosystem. In terms of the ecosystem of what we all want here, which is achieving um, AI systems, which are good for humanity. What do you think the opportunities uh, are for different skill sets to be developed or different organizational structures? Obviously, a lot of people here have, will be part of For Humanity, uh, you know, which has a certain view on, on audit of AI systems. But what do you think the missing players are? Maybe it's third party assessment companies, maybe it's consultancies to help get the data science right. Uh, maybe it is more certification schemes. Um, it's a question to everybody. What, what do you think the gaps are in the ecosystem that might need to be filled? You know, that, this is a, a tougher one for me to answer from my approach as a, uh, a, a government uh, official. All I can say is that um, you know, we appreciate all the outside interest in this. We appreciate that people are coming together to um, uh, create groups like this to be able to talk, get the conversation going, to include us uh, and I think I speak on behalf of both of us as regulators to be a part of it in this conversation. And, you know, the fact that there is so much interest is really what we like to see and that people are out there caring about these issues that will help us, you know, as we both either make regulations or in, if there's new laws or, you know, or any kind of guidance to have that public input is extremely valuable. Um, that's why in the rulemaking process here in the United States, there's a uh, notice and comment period where people can submit comments. And we have to look at the agencies. We look at those every single one of the comments, whether they're, they, they're for what the agency wants to do or totally against or just completely critical or complimentary. We have to look at every single comment. So the more people engage in all process relating to um, regulation, it, 
for me is a very good thing. And I appreciate um, not just for humanity, but everyone on this call's interest in doing that and helping us as we uh, move forward with whatever these various agencies are going to do. I think that interest from the outside is, is really what makes it critical because ultimately these are going to be the rules, regulations, laws that are going to be enforced and that uh, people here are going to have to live with. So the more interaction in that process is a very good thing. And I thank everyone for being on this call today. Thank you. Okay, I've got two more audience questions I think we can try and cover off before the end. Um, the first one is quite interesting. How can we or, sh or should we improve on public disclosure to drive forward transparency and accountability in, in AI systems and their use? Um, certainly at the moment I feel that's very limited where I am um, in Europe. Um, I, what do you think, Fairness? So, and I mentioned this earlier, I think uh, when we spoke to our panel experts, they thought that really um, the appeals process and transparency in terms of um, the development of the system uh, should definitely be something that implementers uh, think about. Uh, but I'm also clearly aware that in the classified space. So one of the early, I would say, more matured agencies in the federal government right now using AI is the Department of Defense. And I could imagine that there are some spaces that may not be appropriate uh, and may not lend to the level of transparency that the public uh, would like to see. So um, I, I think with that said, uh, definitely documentation uh, is key here, uh, especially from a third party assessment, be it classified or unclassified spaces. And in terms of the stakeholder community ensuring the users of the system uh, are, are included from the early you know, life cycle perspective are some key ways. I do want to also make one more comment about transparency. You know, transparency in this in, for AI solutions is not, uh, it's not a constant. Uh, if it's a medical technology where the tool is, you know, providing some diagnostics, if you have cancer or not, yes, you want some transparency in how, how the algorithm came to that decision. Uh, if it's a tool that is, you know, telling you make a right turn at the next signal, you know, it's an autonomous vehicle of sorts, I'm not sure you need all the transparency on how the, how the tech made that determination. So even the level of transparency in terms of which sector the system is being used at, uh, would naturally vary. That leads in very nicely to the other question I had, which is about explainable AI, because of course transparency is a wider topic. You know, we have concepts of documentation, which forcing people to write documentation so it can be audited is always good in my eyes. But that kind of dynamic explainability is, uh, and there are many dimensions of explainability, whether it's local, global, um, whether it is something that's comprehensible to the user or comprehensible to the operator. Um, do you think that people should be encouraged to invest in making sure their AI systems are explainable? And I'll ask you, Keith, because I know you've got to run in a second. Yeah, and thank you, and I appreciate that. And I've, I've called, you know, at least for the explainability, I've started discussing that in the impact it has in the results, right? So not necessarily just talking about the transparency of what the AI um, code is yet, which is which is beyond my knowledge base of, of how it, it actually works. I understand maybe the data set that goes in and the results, but taking a look at the results, I've really, you know, I've publicly said that employers who are using AI technology should really press the vendors for details and helpful questions that I think that should be asked right now are, you know, what type of statistical analysis um, do the vendors perform to test for impact on the discrimination side under our laws? You know, how did they choose those methods? Why do you think that they are the right method in that case? What were the results of the analysis? And how do you re and do you retest? And how do you retest for impact as the training data changes or grows? So that's the what I'm calling for that at least in the HR space that employers who are buying this technology ask the vendors for. And, and you know a lot of vendors have very good answers to these and they can actually point to the statistical tests they're using. So it doesn't necessarily get into the coding algorithm part of it on transparency. It's the it's the results, which we all see, and how did you get to those results? How did you test them to make sure that um, they're not discriminating against the law? So, uh, you know, at least for now, that has been my public calling on, on pushback on the data. How did you get there? 
how is it, you know, statistically, how does that work, which I think will be very uh, illuminating for a lot of people who are really looking into the space. I, mean, I think that that's a, that's a really important thing to try and achieve. I mean, obviously, from the point of view of somebody like ourselves, it makes our life a lot easier. But more importantly, it just helps build up the trust and confidence in these systems because you know, we're all having to take on trust what happens in the algorithm or in the black box. And I think the more openness there is and an agreed situation that you know, vendors, for instance, have to be open about that. Great. Okay, so I think we've kind of come to a natural end to the questions. So I guess does anybody want to make any final points? I actually have to uh, uh, run a little early, so I will conclude. Uh, thank you so much for the time today. Again, thanks to uh, for humanity, Ryan and Adam for for uh, putting this together, and everyone else involved. You know, I really appreciate all the support you've given me as I uh, ventured into looking at AI in in the HR space. And let's keep the conversation going. You know, I really need, as I said in my opening, you know, let's work together on, on how we could provide guidelines um, for everyone to be able to use AI responsibly and ethically, and uh, especially on the vendor side, and, and, and how can we communicate in a language to the vendors who, who may not be lawyers, who may not be ethicists or computer scientists, to understand the long existing laws here in the United States and how we can develop um, AI with that in mind so it can be used properly. So um, please reach out to uh, me in my office. I'm, I'm happy to take a, additional uh, comments or concerns as we uh, move forward in discussing this, this, uh, this very uh, important topic. And again, thank you all for having me. Thank you very much. Anybody else, any final comments? Yeah, I'd like to just echo, uh, I want to thank Ryan and his team at For Humanity for this platform. Uh, and again, just my pitch again, that if you, uh, once you have a chance to look at the AI accountability framework, if you have any feedback, if you have any thoughts or comments, we really, really welcome that, welcome that. Even though it's not a public comment period, we want to make sure that we we have the implementer, the practitioner's perspective. So if there are any, if there is any feedback or any case study approaches, if you've used the framework or you plan to use the framework in your own application spaces, uh, we really welcome that learning as well. And it's really been a pleasure to have this conversation this morning. Thanks for joining us, Farinaz. Hugh, any final thoughts? Uh, just to echo those, I think it's been a very interesting session. It's great to get views from diff different places around the world. We're all grappling with the same problems, and I think the more we can cooperate and collaborate, the better. Um, so thanks to For Humanity for creating the platform where we can do that. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to the audience uh, for listening and for your questions as well. That's been great. I'm sure um, you'll all be on to the next session now. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. What is an infrastructure of trust? An infrastructure of trust is designed to help the public, help a party that has no ability to get into the details to know and feel confident that a set of audit rules